Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks so much for taking the time to join us for this webinar today. Before we get started, I just have a couple of little housekeeping notes. This is a webinar style event, so you cannot turn on your mic or camera. Um, we are recording this event and it will be available on our YouTube channel and other social media platforms um, before the end of the week. Um, when it comes to the question and answer, the Q&A section of the program, please use the Q&A feature found at the center bottom of your screen rather than the chat. And that'll just help me keep up with what questions come in first and what have been answered and, and all of that good stuff. Um, and we are gonna try to get to as many questions as we can today um, while keeping in mind everybody's time. Uh, so for those of you who don't know me, I am Catherine Calhoun Cutshaw. I'm the collections manager at Buncombe County Special Collections. It's formerly the North Carolina room at Pack Memorial Library. Um, we are in the midst of a lot of changes right now, so we aren't open for regular uh, walk-in service, but we are making appointment uh, appointments for folks who need to do research for two hour blocks during the time that PAC Library is open. So if you have any questions about that, you can certainly get in touch with us. Um, we hope that we'll be walk-in ready by early spring um, and we'll be able to match PAC's hours. So uh, wear your masks, schedule your shots, and do all those wonderful things so we can get back to business as usual. Um, so in the meantime, for you to keep up with us, I encourage you to follow us on social media. We have an active Facebook page called Buncombe County Special Collections, and we're also really active on Instagram. Um, our handle is at AVL History, and we've been doing some fun, more casual programming on there as well. So those are a couple of different ways to keep up with us. Um, and I'm so excited to welcome our speaker today, especially as a UNCA alumna. Um, Dr. Sarah Judson is a professor of history at UNC Asheville, where she's been teaching since 1998. And besides teaching in the history department, Dr. Judson also teaches classes in the women and gender studies and Africana studies departments. Her research centers on working class movements in the urban South and has taken a critical look at urban renewal in Asheville with pieces such as I'm a nasty branch kid, women's memories of place in the era of Asheville's urban renewal. So thank you so much, Dr. Dudson, for being here today, and I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you so much, Catherine. I really appreciate being here. And, um, you know, I want to say thank you to the citizens of Asheville who have so generously helped me with my research. And for me, it's always kind of a weird experience to present my work since it's not that long ago. And so there may be many members of the audience who were there during this time. And so if that's the case, I am so grateful for your input and the way that you've um, shaped Asheville history. So I'll begin. On September 29th, 1969, Asheville High School student Shirley Brown Dillingham stood before city officials and community leaders to declare, I was born in jail and I'm still in jail. On that day, Ms. Brown Dillingham was part of a group of students and African-American community members voicing their anger and their protest at the treatment of black high school students by the police. Ms. Brown Dillingham faced this crowd at an open meeting of the Buncombe County Community Relations Council. The meeting had been called to look for some solutions to the problems that had caused the walkout at Asheville High School on September 29th. Declaring I was born in jail, I'm still in jail, Brown reiterated the views of other Black speakers who refused to back down on their charges that as students and residents, Black people in Asheville experienced injustice, discrimination, and police violence. Ms. Brown Dillingham voiced her pain that living in Asheville was like a jail sentence with no hope for future freedom. Black students, like Shirley Brown Dillingham, who stayed in Asheville, could expect a future of low wage service work, inadequate housing, and the dismantling of their neighborhoods by urban renewal. Earlier that day, African American high school students staged a walkout to protest mistreatment and lack of regard for the issues Black students faced as they attended the previously white high school. And here's a 
image, a wonderful photograph um, by Roger Ball of the protests. And I just wanna say that his photos of this event are striking and amazing. And um, I'm, I'm so grateful that I have a few of them to show today. So anyway, this is a photo of the, the walkout. And so after many years of resisting full school desegregation, the city of Asheville completed its desegregation plan in 1969. Bringing black and white high school students together was the last step in the official plan. And this prevent, presented many challenges to black students. They had to leave their school, South French Broad High School and enter into the student population of Lee Edwards High, which was now renamed Asheville High. And this was the second time that African-American students in Asheville had had to leave their high school. Uh, when Stevens Lee High School was shut down just a few years earlier, students and community members mourned the loss of that beloved institution. So students had to leave their school, but they also left behind teachers and administrators who cared about their success. And they came face to face with different forms of racism that attempted to put them in their place. Now, across the United States in the late 1960s, high school students walked out of their high schools to demand that school boards and administrations address inequality in educational resources, lack of access to college prep courses, and other curriculum and dress code issues. While mostly Black students engaged in protest walkouts, in some parts of California and Texas, Chicano students protested in a similar fashion. The walkouts were designed as dramatic actions to force changes in schools. But despite, and despite the views presented in mainstream press coverage, the walkouts were not the actions of angry nihilistic troublemakers, but organized and thoughtful demonstrations of community self-determination, demand for respect and recognition, and a rejection of the miseducation Black students were receiving. Students in Asheville, like students across the United States, were frustrated with the problems in their school and community and equally frustrated with being ignored and like their parents, treated as troublemakers. While Black high school students in Asheville were being displaced from their school, Black city residents in Asheville also experienced displacement by urban renewal. A several decades long urban renewal project displaced hundreds of Black families and individuals. This urban renewal project was the largest in the Southeast and covered almost 500 acres. The targets of urban renewal were historic Black neighborhoods and with this city redevelopment, the community-based institutions that formed African-American life, neighborhood life in Asheville began to disappear. Streets were rerouted or destroyed, homes were paved over and families were displaced. So as students watched their neighborhoods transform beyond recognition, they themselves were thrust into a new setting away from the school communities that had supported them for so many years. As one community member put it, we were coming from a smaller school, a beautiful small school into a large school. And it seems as if we were just swallowed up, we were losing our identity. Students also resented having to leave the newly built school that was centrally located in the South Side neighborhood, a historic black neighborhood. And one of the issues that black students faced was leaving behind teachers who had a strong commitment to their success. While, of this, while the goal of the school board was to merge the two previously existing schools to make one, only 25 African-American teachers transferred over to the high school. Black students had reason to be concerned that they would not receive the same kind of care, commitment and respect that they were used to. O.L. Cheryl was the principal of South French Broad High School and experienced this tradition or this transition on the administrative level. With desegregation, he moved to Asheville High to be a co-principal. And he remembered that there were several white teachers 
who refused to teach black students and quit when the two schools merged. In one situation, a teacher told him that she didn't like teaching poor black kids. She also quit rather than work with black students. So the summer before the two schools merged, black uh, school official and community groups tried to bring students, educators and administrators together to ease desegregation. In these months, Black youth from across the city came together to create a plan for how the two schools would come together. These students were in fact leaders in their neighborhoods and brought an understanding of urban politics to their work. Many of the black students who worked on the transition were already deeply involved in Asheville politics. The Opportunity Corporation, the city's anti-poverty organization worked closely with black youth in teen groups. Shirley Brown Dillingham was a member of the Afro-American Youth Society, an organization funded by the local anti-poverty organization. Ms. Brown Dillingham was 13 years old when she began to work with the Afro-American Youth Society in Asheville. At the time, she served as a youth organizer and worked with neighborhood youth to get them involved in community-based pro programs. Ms. Brown Dillingham was drawn to the Opportunity Corporation because as she remembered, I always knew that I could make a difference someplace. I got a job at the Opportunity Corporation just because I'm a person that's very opinionated. She remembered uh, that the school administrators promised to bring trophies from the South French Broad High School and Stevens Lee and that there would be counselors on hand for black students specific concerns. James McDowell was the vice president of the Hillcrest Teen Organization, the youth group at Hillcrest, uh, the public housing community. In these years, public housing in Asheville was segregated and Hillcrest was for African-American residents. The Hillcrest teens had been drawn into community politics when they had supported a recent rent strike that had set black tenants against the housing authority. The teen organization published a newsletter that publicized issues raised by the rent strike and created a space for youth to write about their views of the strike. James was also a member of the Afro-American Youth Society and worked with Shirley Brown Dillingham and others to ease the transition. Students like Shirley and James were part of an organized youth movement in Asheville that was guided by adult activists. Black youth had a number of opportunities to work with mentors who guided their involvement in community issues and provided political education. Leo Gaines remembered being mentored by several black men who worked with youth. Victor Chalk, a Vietnam veteran from Asheville was the adult sponsor of the teen group, the Skylighters. He and Carl Johnson, a leader on the Hillcrest Tenants Association and member of the Black Appalachia Commission ran community programs for Black youth. Preston Dobbins, pictured here, uh, had worked for the Shaw University Outreach Program, but had also uh, had been a leader in the Black Student Movement Organization at UNC Chapel Hill and supported the cafeteria workers strike. And here's a photo of, um, Preston Dobbins speaking out at Chapel Hill in support of the cafeteria worker strike. He came to Asheville and taught political education to black high school students. Uh, Leo Gaines remembered that his political education began with Dobbins. In these classes, Gaines and others had the opportunity to think critically about black political thought away from their parents' disapproval. And Gaines said, in this area, most of the adults lean to Martin Luther King's philosophy of nonviolence. And like I said, that was because most of the people in the black community was totally repressed, repressed by the white society. And even then, the white society saw Martin Luther King as being a radical, as opposed to the Black Panther Party. They didn't pressure us to go in any direction. They would just give us each one of them's philosophies and leave it at that. They'd leave it at that and would leave it in your mind to muddle over yourself. 
So over the summer of 1969, Black students and their families attempted to craft a desegregation plan with school administrators. The school board and administrators promised to support Black students, but the atmosphere was charged with racial tension. James McDowell remembered being on edge as the school year approached and hearing rumors of imminent attacks against Black students. This threat against his safety reflected what it was like for James to live in Asheville as a Black resident. James was vulnerable every time he left the Hillcrest public housing community. This housing complex was surrounded by newly built highways and the French Broad River. The only way to walk downtown or to West Asheville was to cross the Smoky Park Bridge. And he remembered having bottles thrown from cars at him and being spit upon by whites. For many Black students, leaving the safety of South French Broad High School meant walking into a potential danger zone. And when the new school year began, Black students immediately experienced hostility from whites. Despite the planning done over the summer, the school administration did not follow through on its promises to focus on the success of Black students and protect them. Black students, for example, were used to a curriculum that involved Black studies and to teachers who made the course of study relevant to their lives. Now, those considerations were gone. There was no recognition on the part of white teachers that the experiences and expectations of Black students should be acknowledged and highlighted. And almost immediately, Black students complained about threats and racial slurs, but the school's administration refused to take these seriously. There was friction on the sports team, on the cheerleading squad, and in the marching band. James McDowell remembered when a racial epithet was spray painted on a highly visible wall at the school. He was shocked that the principal didn't address it. And he identified a lack of leadership from the administration in addressing the racial conflicts created by the merging of the schools. But Black students tried to work with the administration, both the white and the Black principals, but they refused to take their concerns seriously. The students began to meet outside of school with their mentors to develop a plan for making their grievances heard. The students planned a walkout on the morning of September 29th when students would present Principal Pinnell with a set of grievances that the students wanted addressed and they're listed here. The majority of majorettes and cheerleaders are white girls. An instructor told the cosmetology class that she couldn't do Negro hair. Athletes had been forced to get haircuts. When black students are late a few times, they are sent home. It is hard for many black students to get to school on time because bus service is, or I should say, is inadequate. Negro history is taught by a white teacher and the history textbooks author is a white man and neither is competent to teach Negro history. Black students are called colored and boy and Negroes object to the use of either term. Black students have trouble when they go to the lunchroom. The grievances voiced by students pointed to some key issues they faced at their new school. They felt like they were not seen and they were ignored by the administrators and teachers, that they were treated differently from white students, that the use of racial insults was accepted by white teachers and staff, that the curriculum undermined their success, that they faced real obstacles with transportation for which they were then punished, and that Asheville High represented a hostile environment for them. Students pointed to conflicts that highlighted their second class status in the new school. It wasn't just that there were unfair penalties for being late since there was no school bus for black youth. Students felt attacked at their very core. White students and faculty observers and some black adults argued that these grievances seemed petty or just stupid. From the viewpoint of some white students, Black students were just trying to get attention or stir up trouble. 
However, the complaint about cheerleading demonstrates how the most intimate aspects of student life became politicized in this setting. Stevens Lee High School was known throughout North Carolina for the skill of the cheerleading squad. This tradition was carried on at South French Broad High School. When young black women joined the cheerleading squad at the new school, they expected to be able to continue their cheer style. Very quickly, conflicts broke out. The cheerleading quote coach was a white woman who did not approve of black cheer styles. She complained that they used too much soul. One black cheerleader remembered that the coach demanded that the young women use stiff moves like the white cheerleaders. They all ended up in the principal's office, but the issue was never resolved. The black cheerleaders were determined to maintain their expertise and to quote the cheerleaders, we continued to cheer our way and they continued to cheer their way. For these black cheerleaders, their skill and bodily integrity was at stake. These young women had honed their craft and knew their talent. The coach tried to violate their control over their bodies and devalue their skill. Their response was to not back down. This devaluation of young black women's bodies and skill was carried even further with the majorettes. One young black woman was told she couldn't try out for majorettes because her hips and thighs were too big. Her mother had a meeting with the band director and she was told the same thing. But the young woman's mother had taped the meeting and when she took the recording to the school board, the band director denied ever having made that statement. The mother played the tape and the young woman became a majorette. This young woman's mother knew that in this situation, the white band director could not be trusted. She was ready to support her daughter in this hostile environment. These victories for young black women showed that students and parents were ready to fight when whites attempted to diminish their value. Individual students who tried to maintain their dignity and fight back were often vulnerable to punishment at Asheville High. In the first month of school, Leo Gaines faced off with Principal Pinnell. For Gaines and other black students, this event revealed the racist attitudes and biases deeply embedded in this white institution. Pinnell had sent Gaines home from school for not wearing socks, but according to Gaines, the conflict ran much deeper. Gaines believed that the school administrator, uh, administration was not open to working with black youth who were newcomers to the school. Early on, he and uh, other students brought complaints to the administration, but he remembered Pinnell had no respect for black students when we first came to school over there and we were being chastised for anything that we'd done. And I saw that sock thing as just an excuse to jump on me about something. I think I was in the hallway without a pass. That seems to stick in my mind because I was thinking, I never had a teacher or anything say anything about me not wearing socks. It was an unusual thing I thought, and I thought it was racist and that he was exerting his power over me. After the suspension of gains, the students finalized their plan for a nonviolent demonstration on the front steps of the high school. The students were especially supported in this by Victor Chalk. Chuck was a Vietnam veteran whose service had made him acutely aware of systemic racism. He encouraged black youth in the Skylighters Club to understand how issues like urban renewal threatened their communities and supported their fight to be heard. Chuck recalled how impressed he was with the way the students put together their grievances and organized the walkout. Chuck appreciated how students connected their personal experiences to the racial dynamics of their communities. And he remembered for a group of teenagers to be that aware, that alert, I thought it was outstanding. So on September 29th, 1969, around 200 black students walked out of the school and held a demonstration on the front steps. According to a participant, they sang soul songs and students 
Uh, they sang soul music songs and students gave short speeches about some of the problems Black students were now facing at their new school. The students presented the list of demands to the principal who said he would grant some of the demands, but not all. The protesters then began singing, do right, white man, do right. Pinnell left and then returned, demanding that the students go back to class. During the time he was gone, he had called the police, who then appeared, pictured here, intending to clear the grounds. The police entered the scene with police dogs, water cannons, and batons. By the time the police showed up, more Black students had left their classes and joined the walkout. The police tried to herd the students off of the school steps and trap some against a wall. Tensions escalated and soon the walkout had been transformed into a riot. Bricks and rocks were thrown, students were punched and thrown to the ground. Both police and students suffered injuries. One participant remembered that the police had started the violence, throwing girls and hitting boys with those riot sticks. Inside the building, students ran through the halls and out of their classes to join the walkout. It was a frightening event for witnesses. Shirley Brown Dillingham remembered the events of that morning and she said, 9.15 was the time. All of us were going to get up and walk outside. We're going to stand outside the doors. We're going just to stand out. And then people were standing outside on the front lawn. I remember that. They called the National Guard. I remember them lining up. I remember the bayonets or batons or whatever they called those things. And people getting punched in the stomach because people did get hurt that day. So the conflict between the students and the police had quickly escalated. For many students, parents and community members, the behavior of the police that day was shocking. It seemed clear that the principal had overreacted and tried to shut down the protest with brute force rather than using any form of mediation. Some students remembered seeing the police lined up using any form or lined up at the back of the school before they emerged to confront the students. They recalled seeing fully armed officers wearing helmets with riot shields, handguns, nightsticks. For many students and faculty, it seemed clear that the police had escalated the conflict. There were a number of injuries that morning with students, police, and the press hit by batons, debris, and fists. One car parked at the entrance of the school was overturned and the windows of a new building on campus were smashed in by bricks. By noon, the principal dismissed classes. The violence spread off campus with some cars overturned and some assaults. Here's a, some coverage um, of some off-campus aspects of the walkout uh, from the Hendersonville Times. The mayor initiated a state of emergency and a nighttime curfew. He received support from Governor Scott in the form of 27 riot control trained state highway patrol troopers. And the state troopers set up a headquarters east of downtown and not far from Asheville High. The mayor also brought an injunction against several of the student leaders and they were banned from school grounds. All extracurricular activities were suspended and teachers were deputized to detain students who might cause trouble. In their reaction, or I should say, in the days following the walkout, there were numerous public meetings to get to the bottom of the events. The day of the walkout, the Buncombe County Community Relations Council held that previously referred to meeting with black students. At the meeting, the students argued that the violence would not have happened if the police had not been called to the campus. They asked why Principal Pinnell was so unwilling to take their grievances seriously. Why resort immediately to force? George Watkins, a student involved in the protest, recounted that the chief of police had been instructed to go right ahead when he saw the black students on the school grounds. He argued that the violence would not have happened if the police had kept their distance. 
One young woman held up her bandaged arm at a riot stick and said, this is what your police force is doing for our black people. Another student told the council that the city manager led the policemen toward the demonstrators by yelling charge. Another student took a more militant tone telling the audience that if we don't get our demands that school is gonna stay closed. One student called the desegregation efforts into question asking if black students could return to their segregated schools. Adults from the community tried to take a more moderate tone. Lloyd McCord, legal redress chairman for the Asheville NAACP, took a more conciliatory tone when he asked that students turn over their complaints to the NAACP. And he said, don't go into the streets because you will hurt your reputation and your physical condition. He promised an investigation by the NAACP legal staff and said, if the city manager needs to be arrested, he will. And if the principal needs to be fired, he will. However, many students, family, community supporters rejected this approach. Nobody believed that the powerful city manager would be arrested or the principal fired. In the past, the NAACP had lent minimal support to Black protests and had often tried to control the direction of these protests. Earlier in 1968-69, this division over leadership and strategies had exploded during the Hillcrest rent strike when tenants' rights activists had challenged the mainstream Asheville Black leadership over who could speak for them. The leadership of the local NAACP had not supported the rent strike and tenants had expressed resentment that the NAACP would dare speak for them. This conflict reemerged during the walkouts. James McDowell made reference to this division when he asked, where were all you high-class people when we were keeping off the police? We will keep on fighting for equality if we have to burn the town down. Other speakers agreed with Shirley Brown Dillingham, who spoke out against living trapped as if in jail under white oppression in Asheville. Victor Chalk issued a passionate call for black self-determination in support of the students when he said, whatever it takes to get our rights, we are willing to do. We bleed in Vietnam, we might as well bleed here. So the militant position of black youth and adult supporters shocked white leaders and some black leaders. Many whites in Asheville had no knowledge of or relationship to African-American residents. The social and political system of segregation and paternalism operating in Asheville meant that whites dominated city government and the economy. Resources, opportunities, and legislation were all filtered through the white power structure. When conflicts did emerge, they were often solved behind closed doors or with the use of the police. And we see elements of this confusion in the city government illustrated in a speech given by Councilman Robert P. Crouch on October 3rd, in which he identified what he thought the real problem was. In his speech, the city councilman said he was tired of intimidations and of racist groups, and he called on the city's moderate black citizens to work towards stopping black militants. According to Crouch, the problem was not white racism, but black racism. He argued that the students and their supporters did not represent the majority of black people in Asheville who had good relationships with whites. The whole thing was the result of outsiders and a few misguided black residents. Couch declared, just as I think it is time for black people to stand up, oh no, sorry. Just as I think it is time for white people to stand up and express their beliefs, I also think it is now time for the black citizens of our community to stand up and be counted. Calling on moderate black citizens to handle the black militants, Crouch advised, they would be doing their race in our city a great favor in stopping black militant leaders before they widen the gap that is now created between black moderates and white moderates. Councilman Reuben Daly 
the lone Black city council person challenged Crouch, arguing that Black moderate leaders were doing all they could to assume responsibility and come up with solutions to the problems. Daly went on to say that Black leaders had also been caught off guard by the walkout, further illustrating the divide between the moderate mainstream leaders and grassroots activists. The activism of Black youth had been developed in local community action programs, working within public housing complexes. These new political spaces fostered a new approach to identifying and solving race issues in Asheville. Therefore, it's not surprising that Daly and his cohort had no knowledge of the students' efforts. This was a protest that was not organized in churches or in black fraternities or sororities. Students had learned from older activists connected to movements across North Carolina, as well as benefited from contact with organizations outside of Asheville. At the time, some whites accused the Black Panther Party of coming in and riling up the youth. This was partly true. Although there was no official chapter, Panther members from Charlotte, most notably Ben Chavis, had visited Asheville and met with students. Leo Gaines remembered being scared by his rhetoric. Preston Dobbins had been radicalized in Chapel Hill when he worked with the Black student movement there to support cafeteria workers. And according to FBI files, someone had indeed made a request to start a Black Panther Party chapter in Asheville. The chapter request had not been accepted, but it does demonstrate that some local residents were interested in institutionalizing a more militant Black power agenda. In the days following the walkout, organized white racists began to respond to the protest brought by Black students and activists. Leo Gaines started getting death threats, something that he did not feel prepared to handle at 16 years old. Victor Chalk's mother was threatened by the Ku Klux Klan. When Chalk and Dobbins attempted to protect her, they were arrested for breaking curfew and on a weapons charge. Looking back, Shirley Brown Dillingham remembered how the combination of excitement and fear created an exhilarating atmosphere. And she said, it was terrifying, it was really unnerving. When you're young, you never see the dangers of all those things as you're doing them. I'm sure older people saw it far differently than younger people just all up in arms, just filled with anger and passion. But it was a fearful time for everybody because people could have gotten shot. People were doing all kinds of things. People were getting arrested. Everybody was angry. And yet at the same time, it was really exciting to people my age. It was just exciting because it was a time of coming out sort of. So on October 2nd, the high school opened, reopened. The school board publicly committed to examining the grievances raised by the students and agreed to take immediate action on several of the issues. The school board committed to hiring an African-American cosmetology teacher. They agreed to factor in the lack of transportation for black students who were tardy. There would be new insignias on athletic jersey and band uniforms and a memorial would be created for the founding principals of Stevens Lee High School. Trophies from Stevens Lee were brought to Asheville High and put on display alongside those from Lee Edwards. For the protesters, however, the winding down of this episode held mixed results. Leo Gaines went into hiding out of town for a year and then finished his high school education at a private school. The Board of Education obtained a restraining order against Shirley Brown, Dillingham, James McDowell, and Victor Chalk, preventing them from further organizing students on campus. The restraining order was deeply felt by Brown Dillingham, who felt a real sense of injustice that she could not graduate with her class. So in the recent past, local historians and community members have attempted to piece together a story of this walkout. And what is striking is how some observers 
authors, commentators, both at the time and in the recent past, discount the voices and experiences of the Black high school students. One woman who was interviewed had been one of the few Black teachers at Asheville High. She characterized the protest as an attempt to be part of the larger civil rights protest movement, despite, in her view, the lack of issues to protest. She described this event as a phenomenon whereby students needed to spend the night in jail and you were not for the cause if you weren't arrested. O.L. Sherrill in an interview also framed the walkout in that way. In his view, it was more about black students fear of being left out of something rather than an event making significant protest. However, after almost 50 years, some former students still vividly remember their activism and the risks they took in those times. Many of these students don't believe that the issues were ever really resolved. Neither, neither the school board, school administration, or the city council made any attempt to apologize or engage in restorative justice. Looking back, some students can quickly muster up the feelings of anger, betrayal, and injustice that resulted from the police violence and lukewarm reception of their demands. Victor Chalk reiterated how the experience of the walkout, the violence from the police, and the dismissive attitude of local political leaders could still cause pain. And he said, it's like when you get a sore on your body. Maybe it looks like it's healed, but if you don't apply the antidote it needs, the problem keeps festering. Today, alumni of the class of 1969 and others get together over the Facebook group, I Survived the Asheville Riot of 1969, and debate, discuss, and reminisce the impact of the event. For many of these alumni, the wound is still fresh and reflected in the current conditions of Black and Indigenous students of color in Asheville. So in 1969, Black students organized the walkout at Asheville High School to show that they understood how desegregation harmed them and that they refused to accept that harm. They used their voices and their experiences with community activism to demand respect for themselves and for the traditions of their community. They protested against poor treatment and blatant discrimination fueled by a sense of dignity and self-respect that was nurtured in Black neighborhoods and schools. Looking back, Leo Gaines captured the wide reaching significance of the walkout at Asheville High School. And he said, we don't make history, history happens around us and we don't recognize it until years afterward. And then people will tell you, you helped make history. I didn't, I was just part of what happened that became history. I had no sense that what I was involved in was historic. I felt it was a responsibility knowing the history of Black America. For Shirley Brown Dillingham, several decades later, she explained what the walkout had it meant for her. At times the walkout was scary and she knew she was taking risks, but it was really exciting to people my age. It was just exciting because it was a time of coming out sort of if that makes sense. I'm not taking the back seat or any of that anymore. So it was both of those things. It was both fearful and exciting at the same time. And because I wasn't a parent, I didn't see it the way my parents saw it or the way more educated people saw it. We just saw it from the heart. I'm tired and I'm not doing it anymore and I'm going to stop it. People aren't going to spit on me just because that's what it was like for us. So I, I thank you, I am done talking, um, and I appreciate your time. Thank you, Sarah, that was awesome. Um, I think this is such a great talk and I, it's something that, that comes up a lot and it seems like the, the facts are everywhere. So I really appreciate you sort of collating all of it into, um, into this talk. So uh, for those who are still with us and would like to ask questions, 
if you would use the Q&A function to ask those questions, um, I'll give it a couple of minutes, but it looks like, um, let's see, I've got at least one in the queue here now. So, so John asks, um, by the time I went to Asheville High in 78 through 81, the population of the school was approximately 50% white and 50% African-American. So one question is, what was the racial makeup in 1969? And the second part of that question is, what percentage of white students left Asheville High School when integration began? Those are really good questions. Um, wait, what's happening? Um, those are really great questions. And off the top of my head, I cannot answer that question. I simply do not have that data in front of me. And I would really hate to say the wrong thing. But I think that other people, perhaps in the audience, could answer that question. And that's certainly something that wouldn't be terribly hard to discover with a little bit of digging. So um, if you'd like to, to send this question to us um, at the, at special collections at PACNC at buncombecounty.org, we'll certainly be able to answer it as a reference question. Um, let's see. So uh, Gregory asks, do you know what happened to the black teachers at South French Broad who did not move to Asheville High School? You know, I, again, I, that is such a good question. And I simply could not say for sure. Um, and again, like, it's really possible that folks in the audience might know the answer to this question. And Catherine, you might know this too. Um, I didn't really look into that, although this is part of a larger project. And so I'm sure that I will. But today, I can't say for sure. And um, my colleague, Zoe Ryan, has done a lot of research on the teachers who were at um, Stevens Lee High School in 1964. That was the last year that students were at Stevens Lee rather than South French Broad. Um, and we've got a big, giant, like four inch, three ring binder with as much information as she could uncover about the folks who were teaching in 1964. Um, so that includes folks like uh, Mr. Cheryl, who went on to become the, the co-principal. Um, so uh, Bruce Cahoon, hi Bruce. Um, he said that it was, it's amazing to him that the professor or that the professor, that the principal wanted to try to diminish what the students were doing. And um, I'm gonna add to that and say that, you know, it's been, from hearing from some former ACE board members that there was a lot of resistance among adults in the community to what they were doing. Do you wanna to speak to that just a little bit? Yeah. yeah. Oh, so, I don't know what's happening here. Um, yes, so I also was really, I found it really fascinating the way that not just Cheryl, but other people um, really discounted the, the deep feelings and um, feelings of violation and um, injustice that the students felt. And it was almost as if um, like their feelings didn't matter. And the, that, that what they identified as um, issues of justice and recognition and inequality in the eyes of these other folks simply were not at all. It's just kind of personal. And sort of like, well, you know, you didn't get to be in LA or Boston or Atlanta. So you're just gonna make something up here so that you can feel like you were involved. And that is so offensive. I mean, I'm, I, I feel it as a historian because I, I see the, um, you know, I see the, the experiences that the students had and this sense of loss and the way the, the mistreatment and the kind of second-class citizenship that they experienced. How's that not a justice issue? And so that's just really fascinating to me. And then of course it makes me think about how nobody listens to teenagers ever. I, I think this is an issue really worth discussing and, and I'd be interested to hear what other folks said. Yeah, absolutely. Cause that, um, that's something that is an issue now, right? Is, is you're just angry 
young people and you don't know any better and the only thing you know to do is to get out on the street and become destructive. But when you really get into those narratives, you find out that actually they were very well organized and had a plan and it wasn't until the police showed up that things went wrong. Um, yeah, and I love the story. I love um, what the story of Shirley Brown Dillingham, who is at this time um, such a committed activist at such a young age. She starts working for the Opportunity Corporation at 13, doing anti-poverty work. And so these are young people who are coming with a pretty high level of political sophistication and engagement and views on. Um, you know, the role of the community in making change. And so you, you place that next to a long tradition of kind of paternalism, um, you know, the white power structure makes the decisions, it kind of filters down. There's not a um, from the bottom up kind of grassroots component to making change. Um, and so they really challenge that in some powerful and significant ways. And to me, this, this uh, walkout at the high school is an example of grassroots community activism challenging a power structure that refuses to acknowledge their worth and their voices. And the fact that other people don't see it that way just says a lot about them. But maybe I shouldn't now, say. Maybe this is our last one and we'll wrap it up here because I think this is a really good place to, to end. Um, you mentioned that the local Black grassroots organizations had different views than the Black leaders in the NAACP on the advancement of civil rights. So this is similar to the last question. When did this gap close? Um, I'm going to add if it ever has. And was there always a gap between Black civil rights groups in Asheville during the 60s and 70s? You know, I think this gap is, is extremely important to, to identify. And uh, the there's so many things to say about this. We could we could spend out a very long time talking about this, um, but this speaks to I think the class issues within African American neighborhoods and communities here in Asheville, and the way that the politics of paternalism identifies certain Black leaders as legitimate leaders, and because of class position or level of wealth, other people are not seen as leaders are having a significant voice and therefore their issues are not of concern. Um, so when the Hillcrest tenants start going to war against the housing authority, this issue is not seen as a significant one by um, other black leaders and the NAACP is more interested in um, kind of smoothing things over than really supporting the claims that the tenants have. Uh, this happens again in in the mid 70s with anti-police violence or anti-police brutality um, organizing that goes on. And I'm sure there are folks who could say more about this as well, um, who lived during this time or may have been involved. But I think that the gap was wide for a long time. And as Catherine referred to, it probably still is there. Awesome. Well, thank you, Sarah, Dr. Judson, so much. Um, this was an awesome talk, and I know that folks got a lot out of it. Um, again, just to wrap up, um, this is presented by the Buncombe County Special Collections, which is a small special collections local history library in Pack Memorial Library downtown. Um, we are now open by appointment during the, all the same hours that Pack Library is open for walk-in service. So if you are interested in coming in and looking at um, Zoe Ryan's research on the 1964 teachers at Stevens Lee or looking through Asheville High School yearbooks, we've got them. Um, so just get in touch with us. The best way to do that is via email. And our email address is pack, P-A-C-K-N-C at buncombecounty.org. And Buncombe County is all spelled out. So again, thanks all for being here. This will be available on our YouTube channel and other social media for you to share with family and friends at some point um, and over the next couple of days. So thank you and we'll see you next time. Thank you. Thank you.